Well, good morning, everyone. Welcome to this morning's study, the last morning study of the week, uh, addressing Daniel chapter 11. And, uh, of course, we have studies tomorrow evening and uh, Sabbath morning. Um, but before we begin the study, let's begin with a word of prayer. Dear gracious Heavenly Father, we are thankful to be here this morning to open your word and to receive light for our, our feet. We know, Lord, that there's much that we do not understand, and um, and yet there's much that we do that has light that has come from your word and that has guided us. But we know, Lord, that uh, there's much that we need to learn because there's much that needs to change in our own hearts. And we just ask, Lord, that we can obey the light that you've given us and that we can have that change in us. We pray that uh, you can be with those that are searching out truth, that you can guide their minds, that in our individual study, we can come to know you. Be with us now, we pray and ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Good morning again. Excuse me. Got the sniffles a bit. So, um, just to kind of give an overview of what we have been trying to do. So we had worked out uh, in Daniel chapter 11, basically from verse 29 to 39, um, clearly showing the history of papal Rome from its rise that's going to happen with the fall of pagan Rome. So we know that pagan Rome is the power that hinders Second Thessalonians chapter 2. And that in the 6th century, uh, pagan Rome is taken out of the way so that papal Rome can be exalted to the throne of the earth. The power that takes away um, or that sets up uh, papal Rome is France. It's also involved, uh, along with all the other Germanic tribes, in taking down of pagan Rome. So pagan Rome is part of the daily and the abomination of desolation being set up, set up by France, and also taken down by France. So at the beginning, we have Clovis and um, uh, Justinian. Um, and then we have, at the end, we have the armies of Napoleon with uh, General Berthier taking the Pope captive. Now, that that period of time, um so in in 538 do we do we have a specific date in 538 that we mark because we, we do have that sunday law but the the third council of orleans which i believe is was may 7th or something 538 about may 7th so i think whether that is what we um use because there's a sunday law there i don't know you know, if we use that date, May 7th, I'm just going to, uh, I've just, just been working on some of the chronology of this. Yeah, it does show that that was the 7th of May of 538, Julian. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, just for people's information, um, if we go from 538 to February 15th, 1798, it's a period of 460,123 days. And um, now it's interesting, 1260 years. So if we take 1260, so it's, it's I mean, it's obviously uh, 1260 years. Now, 1260 actual years would be 460,215 if we had the same date on the Julian calendar. So obviously we don't have the same date. We have... February 15th, so it's going to be short of 1260 years. Right, so it's, so it's not exact, um, but it doesn't have to be exact for that prophecy. Now, when we go to the 1290, we also have a date, which is 508, um, but we have December 25th, the baptism of Clovis, and that's 470,848 days to February 15th, 1798. And then if we look at the, uh, the 1335, we count that again from December 25th, 508 to the 
to April uh, 18th, I'm going to count just including that. So you get uh, 487,711 days. So anyway, I was looking at these days and I was looking at the lexical numbers of these verses. And if you add them all up, um, you get close to 1290 years if you start at verse 29 to 39. So I don't know what that means. It's not exact. It's, uh, it's a little bit off. But anyway, so we have, you know, we have all of these, these spans of time. So just getting back to what we have here is we have the end of pagan Rome and the beginning of papal Rome. So that transition, we looked at, we had 410. So I'm going to switch over to this here briefly. So we had, we had tried working out this line and so I've got Daniel 1130. That's what I should do is I should add that 40A to that number. Anyway, I'm going to, I'm going to work on some other things later after the study, trying to deal with some of these numbers. But we have, um, 410, we say marks the beginning of the period of darkness. So that is when the ships of Kittim come in in 410. That's going to be the, the response to the ships of Kittim, and there's 66 years until uh, the fall of Rome. Now, we don't have a, an exact date for the fall of Rome that I could find. What we have is, is an event, and that the event is uh, Romulus Augustus. Is um, There's a coup, so Odiacer's disposition of Romulus Augustus occurring in 476 was a coup that marked the end of the reign of the Western Roman Empire. But I can't find an actual date for it. You know, if anybody has any information on the date of when that happened exactly, maybe even just the month or something, but I don't have a date. It's just we have 476. So we have 410 there to 476, 66 years. And we had some discussion about other events that we could mark and, and the question about the period of darkness. So in creating this line, we have to have a period of darkness. We have to decide what the darkness is. To me, the darkness is uh, the fall of the Western Roman Empire, the, the vandals coming in, ships of kitten. And, and so the time of the end is when Rome falls. And we got 32 years to the baptism of Clovis, and then uh, about 30 years to the Sunday law, May 7th, 538. So that's, I'm there. Yeah, Dwight? No, sorry. I'm just clearing my throat. Okay. And then, um, so we know we have the 1290 and the 1335. Uh, there's 45 years between the end of those two periods. And then the problem that we were having was figuring out. So so to me, I'm, I'm pretty solid on what I would consider the first angel's message. It's arrival, formalization, and empowerment. It would be the second angel's message uh, to decide how what it is that leads to the third angel's message. So one thing we know is there's always a group of people that are being tested right, in, in a message. Now, this, of course, is not the gospel. Right. This is this is where Millerite history as a template. The three angels messages ends up being typified by these events or that they follow a pattern. We could say they sort of are all a typification, but they follow this pattern. And in the pattern, you have a first message where someone is being tested. And then when the second angel arrives, people fail that test. Some people fail and some people pass. Now, in the establishment of the papacy, when we look at Daniel chapter 11, what we have tried to do is stick really close to what has been said in the verses themselves. So instead of just, you know, picking events from history, we're looking at what the Bible picks. So if we go back to verse 29 again, talks about at the time appointed he, the papacy, that's the USA King of the North, shall return and come toward the South. Right. So that's going to be talking about November 9th, 1989. That's going to be talking about Daniel 11, verse 40b. 
Then it says, but it shall not be as the former, that is the fall of Egypt in 30 BC, or as the latter, which, which that uh, means also Western, that is the fall of the Western Roman Empire, 410 to 476. And then we have in verse 30, in which, so we're taking that uh, instead of four, as we have in King James, we're changing that to in which, and I probably should put that in italics when I'm replacing in which, so that bo or bu is not numbered or translated in Strong's, right? Best translated is in which the ships of Kittim, and we know that that represents the Germanic tribal invasions, that's the first four trumpets, shall come against Western Rome. Therefore, he shall be grieved and return and have indignation against the Holy Covenant. Now, here we have paganism tries to destroy, destroy Christianity. So that means this is the end of paganism. There's this battle that, that's in some ways an internal battle between these, between Christianity and paganism. Um, and then it says, so shall he do. E pagan Rome shall even return and have intelligence with them that forsake the Holy Covenant. So what we see is this is the mixture of pagan Rome and Christianity that becomes the papacy. So when it says an arms shall stand on his part, that's the baptism of Clovis on December 25th, 508. Just that, um, and they shall pollute the sanctuary of strength, referring to paganism sanctuary, and shall take away the daily, remove paganism. They shall place the abomination that make it desolate, set up the papacy, in power over church, state, and the conscience of Christians in 538. And such as do wickedly, so we have this as being the Sunday law symbol uh, against the covenant. Shall he, that is the papacy, the spiritual king of the north, corrupt by flatteries. So flatter with prospects of position and material gain. But the people that do know their God shall be strong and do. Right. So that we have God's people that are going to accomplish what God is asking them to do. This is the, the preaching of the gospel during uh, that period. Uh, of the Dark Ages, right, with the martyr's blood being spilt as a witness of the truth, right? So that's why they and they that understand among the people shall instruct many that they shall fall by the sword and by flame, by captivity and by spoil many days, referring to the 1260. Now, when they shall fall, they shall be open or helped with a little help. And um, we connect that to Revelation 1216. And the earth helps the woman during the 1260. But many shall cleave to them with flatteries. Now, the idea of cleaving and flatteries are, are kind of opposites because flatteries refers to slipperiness. And some of them of understanding, that is the wise, see Daniel 1210, shall fall to try them to purge and to make them white. That's the three angels' messages from 1798 to 1844. Even at the time of the end. So again, I've replaced the word to with at. The fact that it's um, clear in the definition of that word, because it is yet for an appointed time. So the time of the end referring to 1798, and the appointed time referring to October 22, 1844. So it's saying that, that this period of the three angels' messages the trying, the purging, the making them, making them white is happening, happening from the time of the end to October 22, 1844. So then it's, it's going to go back and describe this power, this papal power, and the king, that is the papal Rome, the king of the north, shall do according to his will. And this marker we have with Babylon, Medo, Persia, Greece, and pagan Rome. He shall exalt himself and magnify himself above every god. And shall speak marvelous things against the God of gods. Uh, describing the pap papacy, the man of sin, we see that in Second Thessalonians chapter two and the great controversy chapter three. And shall prosper till the indignation be accomplished. So that's going to be the 1260 years, sometimes referred to as the last end of the indignation. And this could be referring, of course, to all of, you know, both the daily and the abomination of desolation. There's two indignations. 
uh, for that that is determined, and, and we're using determined as this period of 45 years that's being talked about in that period of time, shall be done. So that's the 45 years on the 1843 chart. Uh, 12, uh, 1335 minus 1290, the 45 years. Now, it's going to go and describe a bit more about this power. Neither shall he, papal Rome, regard the God of his fathers, nor the desire of women, nor regard any God. He shall magnify himself above all. So he is supreme, supreme religious authority. But in his estate, he shall honor the God of fortresses. So this is supreme civil authority. Now, could this be where we have Charlemagne? Because, you know, it's talking about what's happening, the power of the papacy and its steps. So it receives supreme religious authority. That would be um, the Council of Orient in May 7th, 538. But this, the honoring the God of forces or fortresses, um, this to me might, you know, because it refers, we think this refers to civil authority. Could we connect this to Charlemagne? No. Why not? Charlemagne was king of the Franks from 768 forward. Yeah. Now, we're trying to apply this with what Clovis had done from 507 to 538. So I'm, I'm trying to understand the, the connection then on this for Charlemagne. Because he's going to be an emperor that is then emperated, whatever they call him, crowned by the Pope, right? So you mean Corbin, because he became the first Holy Roman Empire, or emperor? Yes. Okay. So that's why we, that's why I would say Charlemagne, because this is just showing this increase of this power that we see here in these verses. Because, I mean, the supreme religious authority is given him, but he doesn't have the civil authority per se, until Charlemagne. I mean, he obviously has influence. But here now, the civil authority is submitting to the power of the papacy in order to take its its role as emperor, right? So that that's why I'm saying, you know, supreme religious authority, that's going to be connected with um, uh, Justinian's decree and this Sunday law that they have in 538, at the Council of Orléans, but uh, supreme civil authority could be marked there with Charlemagne, right? Honoring the god of fortresses or forces, right? Fortresses. And then we have this where it says, a god whom his fathers knew not shall he honor with gold, with silver, with precious stones and pleasant things. Thus shall he do in the most strongholds from the Vatican, with the strange God whom he shall acknowledge and increase with glory. And he shall cause them, the false gods, to rule over many. So in trying to place this more specifically, and he shall divide the land for gain. So this is ecclesiastical con conquest through assumed papal authority. And then that's going to bring us to the time of the end. At the time of the end shall the king of the south a push at him. Right. So that's going to bring us to 1798. So that that covers all of that period from the fall of the Roman Empire with the ships of Kittim all the way to 1798 is all described in these verses. What we're trying to find here is, you know, when does the second angel arrive? When we're drawing out this line, how are we? I mean, we have a time of the end that we had marked as 476. We had Clovis. Uh, baptism as the first angel being formalized, and then the Sunday law as the empowerment of the first angel. So then we have to mark the second angel. That is, we're taking the position that in this line, that the third angel is arriving at 1798. Now, we, we could argue that, you know, maybe that's the arrival of the second angel in this line that all of this other stuff that we're trying to fit in here that's describing the man of sin is not, it's not what's being addressed, but 
So when we look at this line here, we've been trying to put the second angel in here. And so I'm saying, well, we have the religious authority. We could say that's the Sunday law, May 7th, 538. It's a religious council. But then we have Charlemagne, uh, you know, crowned as the Holy Roman, uh, the, M, the emperor of the Holy Roman Empire. And we have a date, December 25th, which is a good symbolic date. And then we looked at, well, you know, we're going to have pious at the end. So I suggested, well, maybe it's the, the birth of Pope Pius VI on December 25th in 717. You know, maybe that's it, you know, 917 years later. And then, you know, he becomes Pope. But those could be part of just a line dealing with uh, Pope Pius, right? So, you know, even though they have symbolic dates in there, doesn't necessarily mean they're part of this line of papal Rome. We could mark um, just simply the end of papal Rome as the second angel arriving. But I'm just exploring what it's describing about the man of sin. Can that be, can we place way marks there? And so I just said, well, Charlemagne, you know, so it's just, it's just a guess. It's not, you know, it's not solid in any way. It's not like established or anything like that. But, but it does talk about this. Now we could maybe, so if we go back to our paper. So when it keeps, it describes this, this king, right? We know he exalts himself and magnifies himself. So this is just the general characteristic of the man of sin. And has to do with the beginning. Now, when it says, neither shall he regard the God of his fathers, nor the desire of women. So that's the celibacy of the Catholic clergy. We haven't placed that anywhere. I'm not sure when that began. Uh, Maybe maybe there's a date that we could put in there. Maybe there's something about the characteristics of the papacy that we can mark as this message. So this would be a message that's, being accepted in establishing the papacy. So we have Rome falls, pagan Rome falls. The first angel's message is in addressing the setting up of the papacy. Could it be that the second angel's message is is just establishing that authority of the papacy through that history on, on how that's done, these characteristics? It's just I like to stick to Daniel chapter 11 for for these way marks. But I, I'm not, you know, I've never looked up celibacy. When does it begin? So we'll well, see what the Catholic Church says about it. So it's not something that they had at the beginning. This is something that uh, developed. Anybody know anything about the history of it? I'm just quickly trying to look through. Which history are we dealing with? Just the history of this, of celibacy within the Catholic Church. When does it begin? You may wind up having to go back to between 476 and 511. So that's when it happens? That's when it begins to be discussed. Okay. Okay, so so that's that's something it begins to be discussed. Is there any like declarations that the Catholic Church or the Pope makes at some point? Looking. Anyway, it's something that we need to consider, you know, because it, it mentions it there in Daniel chapter 11. So is there some date that we could attach to it. And this is, is just the question. And that's the way we, inter- no, you know, so um, neither shall he regard the God of his fathers, nor the desire of women, nor regard any God. He shall magnify himself above all. So this could be sort of reviewing that history. I mean, if we put it into that history from the fall of Rome, uh, you know, to you said 511, so 476 to 511 in that period, uh, would make sense why it's mentioned in this order. So he rejects the true God, the marriage of the priesthood, and then doesn't regard any God. He magnifies himself above all. That's going to be the supreme religious authority that we see in 538. Uh, but in his estate, in his position, right, he shall honor the God of fortresses, which would be this supreme civil authority that I would attach to 800. And then it says, a God whom his fathers knew not shall he honor with gold and silver, with precious stones and pleasant things. So, I mean, there's four things here, gold, silver, precious stones, and pleasant things. 
dealing with the idolatrous worship. And, um, you know, in this period of time, this is where we're going to see many of these great cathedrals being built, all of these statues and idols and so forth. I mean, it really develops a lot in that period, the wealth of the Catholic Church in its um, idolatry and pomp. And thus shall he do in the most strongholds. Now, so with the strange God whom he shall acknowledge and increase with glory. Cause them to have. So, you know, we could look at specific events here. Now we have the Vatican in there. Well, the Vatican. So it began with the construction of the Basilica over St. Peter's grave in Rome in the fourth century AD. I don't know much about the history of the Vatican. Okay. So it says here, following an attack by the Saracen pirates that damaged St. Peter's Basilica in five or in 846, Pope Leo the fourth ordered the construction of a wall to protect the Holy Basilica and its associated precincts. Completed in 852, uh, the 39-foot tall wall enclosed what was inaugurated Leonin City, um, an area covering the current Vatican territory and the Borgo district. The walls were continually expanded and modified until the reign of Pope Urban VIII in the 1640s. So they have here, so basically 852, that you have this, I guess, a stronghold, the idea of a stronghold or a fortress with the building of the walls. I wonder if, if that's what we could mark there, because it says he's going to honor this God from the most strongholds. So if we're saying that's from the Vatican, I mean, we could put that, you know, as 852. So uh, how would that parallel with, with um, so what I'm thinking of here is um, if we go to Revelation in, in chapter 13, verse 2, because we already see, you know, parallels with um, Revelation 12 and with Daniel chapter 11. And now here it says, the beast which I saw was like unto a leopard. His feet were as the feet of a bear, and his mouth the mouth of a lion. And the dragon gave him his power, his seat, and great authority. So what is the power, seat, and great authority that paganism gives to the first beast here, to papal Rome? How do we understand that? So remember, the dragon, he gives his power and his seat. Now, the great authority is not his great authority because it's not his to give. So in a general sense, we can look at power as as what? Civil authority that pagan Rome has, his seat as the city of Rome itself, and the great authority being uh, that religious authority that then is bestowed upon uh, the papacy. So the way that I generally look at this is the seat. You know, we go back to, you know, 330, uh, the power. That's going to be uh, 508 and the great authority 538. Could we see here that there's this parallel with uh, first, it's going to be the great authority being the religious authority in 538, the power in 800 and his seat. That's when the Vatican itself has its walls built in a sense as a fortification, fortification in five or 852. Does that make sense to anybody? Can anybody follow what I'm saying? I'm considering it. So, so if we put the Vatican with the walls built in 852, just that that makes it a stronghold, right? In order to be a stronghold, you need you need walls. So, so maybe that that just becomes the great authority is that supreme religious authority civil authority that's the power and then the seat of rome is given back in in 330 but it's really established as a stronghold uh, by the papacy with the building of the walls of the vatican in 852 so maybe we could place that as a way mark possibly and he's going to do this with the strange god whom his fathers um uh, strange god whom he shall acknowledge and increase with glory. So now we know Swearingen tries to put, you know, Mary in here, 
but I would think this this has something to do with the Pope himself in his role. But, uh, yeah, and and then we have this dividing of the land for gain. So this is ecclesiastical conquest through assumed papal authority. So we know that uh, the, the papacy is doing this, right? It's it's controlling what's happening uh, with these nations around it, these different kingdoms and cities and so forth. So causing them to rule over many, you know, and again, you could say, you know, even that could connect to, to Charlemagne as well, this, this authority of the Pope to crown the emperor. So, so that would all be tied together, but I don't know if we could, at what event we could mark. So we have Charlemagne, we have the Vatican walls. But what, what about, um, do we know much about the Catholic mass? Um, like transubstantiation and all that kind of stuff. You know, when was that really an issue? I mean, I, I would think, I mean, it's been around for a long time, but is there some point in which they, you know, so we got Augustine talks about it. So we know by the 11th century, they're using the term transubstantiation. It's the Fourth Council of the Lateran used it in 1215. I mean, I know at some point, you know, originally they didn't, they didn't actually believe in it. It was more just uh, um, an analogy. And then later on, it turned into that they had it become a literal body and blood of Christ, the bread and the wine. And they, they like to claim that this was written as part of the Gospels <laughs> between 52 and 55. But yeah, obviously the, not. Yeah, the text, the, the text of the mass, its order and arrangement in tradition extends to about 604 AD. Okay. Yeah, but we don't, we don't get tra- transubstantiation as a term until the 11th century. Um, so I don't know. I mean, we don't have a specific date for it, but I'm just wondering if, because one of the things is we know about Papalism is it's a counterfeit of the heavenly sanctuary, but it is also a a dressing up in Christian garb of paganism. So the idea here that um, that we have this strange God whom he shall acknowledge and increase with glory, you know, Swearingen's going to say it's Mary. But what if this is just really the sacrifice of the mass? Because it's 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 idolatry. It's from the most strongholds. It's from, you know, that we have this. And this is these false gods that rule over many Christendom, right? So so maybe that's what that has to do with. I don't know. Um, but increasing with glory, I mean, this is basically replacing animal sacrifices with this sacrifice of the mass stolen from Christianity, from the Gospels, and perverted that it really becomes no different than paganism, right? The priest having power over the body of Christ, you know, and not taking it as an analogy, but taking it as actual, you know, the, the bread and the wine are actually the blood and blood or body and blood of Christ. Um, maybe that's what this is talking about, this being this strange God, you know, because if you think about paganism, you know, they usually have like an idol and, and, you know, they have animal sacrifices. But now we have, uh, you know, the Catholic Mass in its transubstantiation form. So it's it's just basically paganism, but it's different, right? That's why it's a strange God. So this acknowledging, let me see what we got here. So, so acknowledge 5, 2, 3, 4, that is to scrutinize, to look intently at acquainted with or care for or respect or revere and then increase seven two three five rava just means an abundance uh, to be an authority to enlarge to increase multiply nourish and of course you know what glory means kabod <laughs> and it means weight literally I don't know what people think about the idea that we could put the sacrifice of the mass in here, whether we would mark that as a way mark, but I'd have to know more about the history of mass. 
And of course, the Catholic Church is going to often, you know, distort the early history of it. So it'd have to be something that could be established, you know, as a waymark. And we'd have to figure out what that would mean. But I do think that the idea of the Vatican. So if we go over to this chart. Um, so maybe we could put here. I'm just going to put this in here. 582. Whoops. Okay. So we get the Vatican walls built. So, so what we would have here is great authority, power, and seat. But these are then established. I'm going to put 582. It's 852. But we would have to say, well, when is this empowered? I mean, we could have Pope Pius VI there, but I, I don't really think that that is, is part of this line. If I knew exactly, I mean, we could just say that, that this is basically the Catholic mass being set up. I'm just going to, um, I don't know. I just want to put the mass in here somewhere. It just at least as a holding spot for something. Because what it's describing there in those verses, we have the Vatican, right? Um, and it says, thus shall he do in the most strongholds from the Vatican with a strange God whom he shall acknowledge and increase with glory. So this, this obviously refers to the pagan worship, right? This acknowledge to scrutinize, to pay attention to, you know, this is, this is the strange God that they're worshiping. And is this strange God, this, the body and blood of Christ, supposedly, right? Obviously it's not. And then it says, he shall cause them to rule over many and, and shall divide the land for gain. So maybe this refers to some, you know, events during the Reformation or I don't know. Is there some point in which this papal power then that this becomes true? I mean, we could say, well, he shall cause false gods to rule over many Christendom. So, I mean, that obviously happens with the papacy. And we have the dividing of the land for gain. But is there some specific point in history that we can mark? In Millerite history, uh, when they dealt with the 1260, prior to having 538, uh, what was the date that people generally used to mark the start of the 1260? Does anybody know what the event was? Anybody know? Does anybody know what the decree of focus is? No. Okay. So it's mentioned by the Millerites quite a bit. Okay, let me see here. I'm just looking in the Millerite writings. Um, let's see if I can find it quickly. Okay, so this is from Josiah Litch, um, an address to the public and especially the clergy. Uh, let me see what he says here. The time, times and a half has long been a subject of deep interest to prophetic expositors and labored arguments and deep research have been expended to fix the time of the commencement with the expectation that when that was done, they would be able to find the beginning of the millennium. Now, the time most generally fixed upon the present time to begin this the period is AD 606 when Emperor Phocas conferred upon the Roman pontiff the title of universal bishop. And from that date, they fixed AD 1866, right? So has anybody heard of this before? No, I haven't. Okay. So anyway, this was, um, let me see if I can find it. So it's Emperor Flavius Phocas Augustus, was emperor of the Eastern Roman Empire or Byzantine between 602 to 610. He declared himself emperor after capturing Constantinople and killing the then emperor Maurice, taking the empire in this manner made him highly distrustful of the elite of Constantinople. So he installed his relatives into positions of power and brutally uh, purged anyone that opposed him. In order to secure his power, he then garnered the favor of the Pope in Rome. He issued an edict conceding to Boniface the third the primacy of the Church of Rome, not only in the Western churches, but also in that of Constantinople and all the Easter churches in 606. This has for centuries been to the exasperation of the patriarchs of the Eastern Orthodox Church. Uh, in 608, focus bestowed upon the Pope 
the Pantheon of Rome, a temple formerly dedicated to Cybele and all the gods, and henceforth to the Virgin Mary and the martyrs. A monumental column was erected in the Roman form in honor of Phocus in 608. The column has been determined to have been originally been created in the second century as part of an unknown structure and was repurposed to honor Phocus. Okay, and uh, just if you want to see a picture of the pillar, there's the pillar. So does this does this fit the bill? Even though it's it's something that's generally ignored, that is none of you have heard of it. it it's something I found when I was researching the right writings years ago, uh, dealing with this. So what if we what if we connected that in some way with this edict or whatever you want to call it of focus, imperial edict of focus they call it here. So he's rather controversial, I guess. So yeah, he's Byzantine emperor from 602 to 610. Any thoughts on this? So we would say this with its increase of glory, he shall cause them to rule over many and shall divide the land for gain. So can we fit the decree of focus in here at all? What was the decree of focus again? Was that about? He, Bestowed, bestowed upon the Pope of Rome. So even though he's going to be a, a Byzantine emperor, he said he bestows upon the Pope of Rome, uh, Pope Boniface the third, the, how does he put it? He issued an edict conceding to Boniface the third, the primacy of the church of Rome, not only in the Western churches, but also in that of Constantinople and all the Easter churches. And that's in 606. So it's and expansion, then, expansion of the papacy. Yeah. And then in 608, focus bestowed upon the Pope, the pantheon of Rome. So that is, which is kind of interesting. Yeah. Um, so, so the pantheon is now given to the Pope in 608. Yeah. The pa- okay. The pantheon. All right. Yeah. Which is yeah. this pagan temple. Right, right, I know. <clears throat> so, so I think that, that definitely to me seems significant. I'm trying to find more from, uh, uh Pioneer's writings about this. It does seem significant. Yeah. Okay. So we got, you know, and usually the Pioneers are just going to talk about it in context of the 1260s, you know, that we use. Of the decree of Justinian for the start of the 1260. Now, which, which is another point I think we should look at too as well. Is when it, what is the date of Justinian's decree? It goes into effect on April 7th, 529, but when is it given? February of 528. Um, so they have this, um, 529, so they don't have it. So I don't know if that would be the best date since his, his decree is earlier. But I need to know more about uh, Justinian's decree. I mean, I know it's part of that. But anyway, so this seems to fit in here, just exactly how we would fit this in. Because even even when we, we have um, from the Vatican walls there, um, you know, we might we might take some of these other events. Because right? what we have then is we have you know, 538, we have that Sunday law, uh, the Council of Orion, and then we have, um, so that's 538, then we're going to have uh, 606, and then we have 608, so 606 is power being bestowed upon, uh, what's his name, Benef- what's it? what's the guy's name, Boniface the Third. And then, um, and then the pantheon being given to Boniface the third by the emperor of Rome at the time, focus. Well, that's rather interesting. So that's going to be 606 and 608. So in a sense, the, the Millerite pioneers, they just, they just kind of reject it as the start of the 1260, right? So they're, they're trying to figure out when is the 1260 begin? 
when is the abomination of desolation set up? And, and many historicist interpreters, interpreters, they're going to use 606, where you're going to have Miller's going to use 538, right? So that was, that's why they discussed it. But we can see that there are some, some interesting characteristics of this. One is it's an Eastern Roman Empire bestowing this upon the Bishop of Rome and giving him the Pantheon. That is so interesting. Um, and this is going to be erected in fr front of the Rasta, that, that column, on August 1st, 608. The last edition made to the Forum, Forum Romanum. It's actually going to give it to Pope Boniface the Fourth, so it means Pope Boniface the Third must have died in that period, according to what I'm reading here. Yeah. So Pope Pope Boniface the Fourth becomes Pope in 608. So so in 606 we have uh, Pope Boniface the Third being declared as the religious authority um, throughout the empire, and then. In 608, he's given uh, the Pantheon. So it's converted to a Christian church. Boniface, according to Bede's ecclesiastical history, Boniface IV had the pagan temple ritualistically purified once its company of devils had been cast out. It was renamed the Church of St. Mary of the Martyrs, in St. Maria Rotunda. As a result, the ancient temple of all the Roman gods was repurposed into a Christian church that venerated martyrs and saints. I would think this is significant in, in connection with these verses. So what if we said these most strongholds here are actually referring to, to the Pantheon in Rome? If I change this to the Pantheon in Rome, and, and that would put this strange god I would now be in agreement with Swearingen here, the strange god, Mary worship, along with the saints. So the false gods, this would be the saints. What do people think about that? Yeah, saints. Saints looks like a good part of that. Yeah, and, putting, and, and we just read that when they were given the pantheon, it was going to be dedicated to the worship of Mary. Right. And yeah. Jesus, and, you consider her a saint. Yeah. But, but specifically the, the purpose of the Pantheon, it's changed to the Church of St. Mary. Right. Yeah. OK. So the Church, the St. Mary of the Martyrs or the St. Maria Rotunda. So as a result, the ancient temple of all the Roman gods was repurposed into a Christian church that venerated martyrs and saints, according to Bede's ecclesiastical history. So, I mean, this fits with what we're reading, right? So if we're, we're dealing with, you know, 508 and 538, this progression makes sense. Yes. Yeah, it seems like the right steps. Yeah. Yeah, it seems like the right steps. It seems to fit. So, um, so then what we have to say is that this second angel arrives. So if we go to this chart and we now modify this. So again, I'm just going to copy this. I'm going to keep these other slides. So now what we would say is we're going to have uh, 606. So this is imperial edict. Of, now they spell his name lots of different ways. I'm going to spell it this way. And then we're going to have, this is 608. Maybe I'll say Pantheon. Pantheon. Uh, I'll just say given to the Pope. So then we have to say, well, when is this empowered? And what if this empowerment is, is the other event that we talked about, which was uh, Charlemagne's ordination or coronation? Because then we can see the power seat and authority, all of these things here. So this is religious authority, the imperial edict of focus in this case. Then we have uh, the pantheon, that's the seat. And then uh, the civil authority with uh, Charlemagne. So what we see is we see the power of the seat and the great authority given 
in this earlier history, you know, 330, 508, 538, however we want to look at this, different people have different dates. But we know that pagan Rome gives it its power, seat, and great authority. But these are then established in this second angel's message. So this is, any thoughts on this? Yeah, so we got, yeah, the Eucharist, it's part of the Mass. Okay, just commenting on Angela's comment. She just looked up some stuff dealing with transubstantiation. Okay, so Angela's a comment in there. But I like this line much better. This to me just seems to follow exactly what Daniel 11 is telling us. Any thoughts? I like it. I don't know what other people think. Yeah, mm-hmm. unless some other information pops up. Yeah, it just seems to me that this follows closely, and it and it you it's connecting. Yeah, so Samuel says it's clear to him. It, it it's it's connecting how we are connecting these verses to uh, Revelation twelve and thirteen, right? The twelve hundred and sixty years, uh, the dragon giving his power seat and great authority, and now we can see that that is being established in this history. And then we had here as a date, we had actually August 1st with that um, pillar, whether that's correct or not. But I thought that was interesting. So I'm just going to put these dates in calendar converted. So I'm just going to put a number of them in here. Okay, so we got... Uh, May 7th, 538. Now, in 606, we don't have a specific date. I'm just going to put the first day of the first month there. And then we got uh, 608. That one we're going to have August 1st. And then we have 800. That's going to be December 25th. Okay. And then we have the end of the period, 1798. So there's the numbers that we have, these different events. So obviously we don't know the exactly in 606 when the decree of focus is. Um, we could also put 508 in there. So we have a date for that, December 25th. Okay, so I don't see anything particularly interesting just in these raw numbers. Well, oh, you can't even see it. I didn't share it properly. There's there's the numbers there. Right, so we've got the different dates. <clears throat> okay. So going back to our diagram, I think this is pretty good. So we, we would attach to here. I'm just gonna pull one of these. So here we would have great authority. Maybe there. Here we would have seat and power. So control over the civil power. And then we normally mark, you know, we usually mark 330 for the giving of the seat. Um, but to some degree, the fall of Western Rome is is also included in that. So I'm just going to put uh, these things here. I'm going to copy these. So we'll say that this is the seat. This is the power. And this is great authority. They make the Sunday law. What's that? It's a great authority and institute yeah. the Sunday law. Yeah, and it has to do with, with religious authority, right? Because the dragon yeah. has civil authority that he can give, and it has a seat that it can give. That's his. It gives him his power, his seat. But the great authority is not his to give. So um, I'm going to mark this some other way. Like that. This kind of sets those apart. So we can uh, put that verse in here. I'm going to just put that verse there so people can see what we're talking about. So we can see how this is connected. What happens with the fall of pagan Rome is going to be connected to what happens in the 6th century with with the setting up of the papacy. And now we're going to see these things established, the great authority, the power of the seed established in this history from 538 to 800. 
And that comes to an end, of course, when the papacy falls, right? Which is, that brings us to Daniel 11, verse 40a. So I like it. A few other people seem to. Um, it it definitely uh, fits with what we have in Daniel chapter 11. Okay. So I'm happy. Hopefully everyone else is. Any final thoughts? Okay. Let's pray. Well, I think 535 should be coming from 508 rather than 538. What are you saying? You have an arc there, a timeline, and you've got the 1335 coming from May 7th, 538 to 1844. Oh, right. yeah. yeah, that's because I moved things around and I didn't, uh, didn't notice that. I know, much. I know. Yeah, okay, that's better. Thanks. Okay, so that's now correct. 1335 going. Okay. Okay, let's pray. The dear Father in heaven, thank you for the study uh, this morning and this week, the things that we could accomplish. And um, we're thankful for your word that speaks to us and speaks about the history in the past, but also to us in the present. We pray that you can be with each person, that you can bring us together again according to thy will to study your word. May your angels watch over each one, protect our family and friends and those that we minister to. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.